Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I once again have Tomas with me for this episode. My friend, my first question for you is, how are you feeling after the horror show? Are you feeling any better? Oh, uh, after watching Monday Night Raw, uh, eh, I mean, it's all right. We, we got summer <laughs> to look forward to. Um, not to get into too much right now because we have another pay-per-view to talk about. I'm just yep. glad they're resolving the Sasha Banks Oscar stuff now instead of just doing some crap at SummerSlam, like I and, said before. And they actually brought in an authority figure on Raw, but uh, Egg. exactly. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of said authority figure, she has a big role in the show we're gonna talk about today. This is the second in our series of 2002 retro pay-per-view reviews. Thank you guys so much for clicking on the uh, on the video just to start off. I really appreciate the support. Uh, we're going to be talking about No Way Out 2002 tonight. Um, <laughs> so just before we get into this, I, I'm already convinced that 2002 is not the greatest year in sports entertainment because going into this show, this, this was not the most spectacular pay-per-view. <laughs> like, Absolutely not. When you look at the card, it should have been, but this is the definition of we have one more pay-per-view to kill before WrestleMania. Let's get it out of the way now. And hopefully it's somewhat decent. And not to jump the gun on some things real quick, but that's what I'll say about the show right away. It was decent. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I have, like, really vivid memories of watching the tape of this as a kid. And I remember being really entertained by some of the matches that I didn't necessarily, like, think were good now. Um, but now that I'm older, I can appreciate like things like the main event more because I was really bored by this main event as a little kid, but uh, we'll get to that. Um, but this show was built around, um, I usually have three points of build, of course, for these retro uh, reviews. The first one is about said main event, the number one contender to the undisputed World Wrestling Federation title. Um, Chris Jericho, of course, is still the champion. His number one contender for this show is Stone Cold Steve Austin who we were talking about in the last review for the Rumble, where uh, Stone Cold was kind of floating around at this point. Um, and now they're just giving him a title shot out of the blue. They needed someone to fill that main event spot before Triple H would go on to eventually face Chris Jericho in the main event of WrestleMania 18 to jump on that a little. And that's what you could say a lot about the main event stars right now. They're kind of floating around, trying to figure out what they're going to do for Mania. Like I said before, The Rock versus The Undertaker is that should be a WrestleMania match on its own. But we got three new heavy hitters who just came back in the company. Mr. McMahon had just talked about injecting the WWF with a lethal <laughs> dose of poison. And who was that poison <laughs> we're talking about? The three men who had left the WWE for World Championship Wrestling, which started the huge phenomenon that was WCW versus WWE. We're talking about Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Hollywood Hulk Hogan, together they are the New World Order, probably one of the, the, not one of, the most controversial wrestling group in professional wrestling history. Yeah, I agree with you. That's a great segue into that next point of build. Vince, Vince is um, still bitter about his loss to Ric Flair at the Royal Rumble. And yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. There was a, it was the uh, Fallout Smackdown episode after the Rumble, I believe where Vince was just sitting in the locker room and he was giving all these really batshit insane soliloquies almost. He was saying like, the WWF has cancer. I'm going to kill it. And he was just talking about like, you know, injecting that lethal dose of poison. And of course he turns the swivel chair that he's sitting in around and it reveals he's been talking to the mirror to himself the entire time. And you have the NWO spray painted on the back of that thing. I thought that was a really great reveal. Um, the build for the NWO, the hype was certainly there. Um, well, once we get into the pay-per-view itself, we got some things to say about this iteration because this was nothing like the WCW version. Yeah, let's just say Vince McMahon, when he wanted to say something on TV or if he wanted to do something on TV, he wasn't Chancer, uh, the lethal dose of poison. And if we look forward into the future, in 2003 where he was literally beating his own daughter and when you fast forward to 2006 where he literally challenged god to a match vince mcmahon has no filter and that's why we love him 
Vince McMahon is batshit insane in the best way. But uh, that actually, you mentioned his daughter just now. And that brings me to my final point of build before we actually get into the pay-per-view. The feud that Stephanie has with her husband, Triple H. Um, There's some marriage problems going on, my friends. Um, So Stephanie McMahon Helmsley has had a pretty interesting build into this Valentine's Day season all the way through uh, through the normal holidays. Um, Stephanie was fired by her father after the invasion angle. She's trying anything to get back into the arena, but Triple H making his return is her in to get back there. And she is really trying hard to, I guess, ride off of her husband's coattails and Triple H isn't having any of that. And it gets to a point where Stephanie basically fakes a pregnancy to renew their wedding vows on the go-home Raw. And that wedding segment was actually a lot of fun on that Raw. Um, Triple H has the great line. He's like, I see you just for who you really are. A no good lying bitch. It's It's funny that you bring that up because everyone talks about the Test and Stephanie wedding. They talk about the drive-thru wedding where Triple H basically drugged Stephanie and drove her through the Las Vegas drive-thru so they can get married. I feel like everyone talks about that wedding, but no one talks about the the wedding vow renewal and the vow renewal is just as good if not better than the I, test stephanie I, triple h wedding i think it's better because at least it makes more sense you know it's not as ridiculous as triple h like drugging the bride you yeah. know to and it, it's a better segue into triple h turning babyface because when triple h returned it wasn't really established that he was a babyface but if anything that crowd pop in madison square garden turned into a babyface which definitely played into WWE's favor because I think that's where they were going with him at that point. Because when Triple H got injured before, remember, he was two-man power trip. Him and Stone Cold Steve Austin were the biggest, baddest heels in the company. He got injured. He got the hero's welcome. He's back, but he still got some. He's got the heel manager. He's got – so you got to split that up somehow. Now, I think they were doing a pretty good to get Triple H on his own to separate him from Stephanie. It's been a year. Everything's different now than from when he left. I agree completely with that. And I think Stephanie sold that whole, like that whole, that whole line really well. Triple H takes the wedding ring off his finger and like throws it at her while she's down on the ground. And the final shot of Raw is Stephanie like growling at her husband. And the they, iconic shot of Stephanie screaming in the wedding dress. Yeah. Yeah. I'm they, just gonna, this is, we will get into this when we get to Triple H and Angle, but to all you kiddies out there that think that Stephanie is annoying in the past like four or five years, oh, you don't know anything. You don't you you don't know shit. Like you don't you don't know what she was like in ninety eight, in ninety nine, and two thousand two. You know, she's always been this unbearable. We've hated her since we were kids. And if you think this the past few years have you seen the worst of her, you don't know anything. Yeah, God bless God Stephanie bless McMahon's it. heart, but like she is so much more tolerable now. But uh yeah, that actually ends our point of builds, um, which takes us to the actual pay-per-view. WWF No Way Out 2002, of course, um, taking place live on February 17th of that year on pay-per-view. It emanated from the Bradley Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which has uh, sadly been demolished and replaced by the Feaster Forum in Milwaukee, I believe is uh, how you pronounce it. Correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments, but uh, no big hype package. It just goes right into the generic rock Jim Johnston music and the, you know, the segue into the pyro. And the first music we hear on the night is the New World Order's theme song. And they come out to a pretty big pop. And I feel like this whole segment really just, it really just showed you how this version of the NWO was going to be. Like, this was all designed for them to get that pop from the crowd and get that appreciation. Yeah, a little history lesson to maybe... Yeah. A little history lesson for maybe the younger fans who don't realize how important this was. Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash were three of the biggest stars in the WWF around 1995. Ted Turner and WCW basically offered them more money to come work for WCW. And we all know Hulk Hogan. He's the biggest star in pro wrestling history. And the fact that Hogan took the money and jumped ship from WWF to WCW basically started the whole snowball effect of WWE just kind of going downhill they were not selling well with pay-per-views they weren't selling well on house shows everything was going bad for them they had no stars anymore hogan hall and nash were their biggest stars and it just kind of kept snowballing where they were losing other stars and it, it, hogan's jump 
and you know Macho Man Randy Savage to bring up a, yep. another, yep. another good one right there. Hogan's jump really started everything for them. So when the Monday Night War happened, to see Hogan, Hall, and Nash finally back, this was a big deal for everybody in 2002. Everybody wanted Hogan and Hall and Nash back during the invasion angle, but even though it took them long to get back here, you never thought you would see the new world order of all people standing in a WWF ring. Yeah, and I agree with everything you just said. It's, um, yeah, and WCW, there's a whole list of people that defected like the New World Order did, but I still had a huge problem with this promo because if the NWO was going to be presented as the poison that was going to kill the WWF, why would you have them come out at the beginning of the show for this pop? Scott Hall's first words out of his mouth were, hey, yo which got a pop in the crowd. Ramon pop. Yeah, Hulk Hogan is just taking the mic and he's thanking the crowd. He's thanking Vince McMahon. He's thanking America. And then they just leave. It's like they're using insider terms and it's almost like the curtain call in reverse. Like... In one sense, I definitely see what you mean. This is definitely not, in my opinion, maybe you should have had something a little more. If they really wanted to pull back the curtain, maybe NWO jumps the barricade during a random match. Maybe you don't make them an official part of the WWE because if they're randomly interfering in matches, jump in the barricade, it looks like, oh, shoot, these guys aren't supposed to be here. What are we going to do? Hogan, Hall, and Nash are ruining everything. That's what the NWO used to do with WCW. They yep. used to attack yep. people during matches. They used to spray paint the NWO on people's backs. But at the same time, as we see at the end of the show, even JR and Jerry Lawler, uh, they, 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 they hint to it on commentary, NWO – they're trying to win back the crowd. They're trying to make it seem like they've turned a new leaf and they're not these bad guys anymore. And they say that when they arrived to the arena, they had so much heat with the boys in the back and they want to prove that that anymore. They want another chance. And JR thinks this is just the NWO trying to pull the wool over the fans' eyes, which we see later in the night. That is definitely the case. Yeah, it's – it's this is a tough subject, honestly, because I agree with everything you just said, but, I mean, if they're still going to be, like, these invaders, like, again, why would you just have this promo? I mean, I, I kind of get where you're coming from and that they're pulling the wall over the fans' eyes, but that's not who the NWO was. They were all about taking over, as simple as that. And now they're here to, yeah. like – you know, trick everybody, and they're not actually the poison that everybody thinks they are, but... Yeah. yeah. You could have at least had them jump the barricade, make them look like they're not, they don't work for the WWE just yet, even though Vince McMahon is bringing them in. You know, it, it makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, But this is definitely not the last we would see of the NWO on this pay-per-view, and that takes us to, finally, our first action on the night which is a tag team turmoil match. And the winners will be getting a World Wrestling Federation tag team title shot at WrestleMania. Uh, Tomas, why don't you explain to everybody what a tag team turmoil match is? Tag team turmoil is basically a tag team gauntlet. Two tag teams start in the match. Once you pin, make pin, make the other team submit, count on disqualification, that team is eliminated. Uh, another team comes in. This process repeats until we have a winner. We have one, two, three, four, five tag teams involved in this match. Scotty, Tuhati, and Albert. Christian and Lance Storm. The Hardy Boys, Matt and Jeff. The Dudley Boys, Bubba Ray and Devon. Accompanied by the Duchess of Dudleyville, Stacey Keebler. And Billy and Chuck and the APA. That was actually six tag teams. Yeah, I was about to say. I was just like, oh, five? <laughs> I was like, I miss something. Uh, but uh, yeah, so tag team turmoil. This is like a staple of Ruthless Aggression, Attitude Era style, like, tag team wrestling this was a match purely designed to get the crowd like hyped up for the show it's like a nice little appetizer for the things to come I'd oh like yeah to say. this was definitely to jump the gun a little the best way to open the pay-per-view because i don't think this card had a good match to open with there was no big you know star-studded match that could have gone on first remember this is back in the day where you had to save the heavy hitters for the main event Nowadays, you could open up with, uh, for example, I don't know, Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman, and that would get the crowd extremely excited for the show. Because, oh my God, we are starting off the show with a world title match. Back then, you kind of had to save your heavy hitters for the last. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they that was a tactic they 
They used it a lot, like, near the end of the Ruthless Aggression era, going into the PG era, starting off with a world title match. But, yeah, the tag team turmoil is a great – a great way to whet the fans' appetite, basically. But this match starts off with uh, Scotty and Albert against Lance Storm and Christian. Um, pretty good action. Um, Scotty Too Hotty goes for the goddamn worm on Christian. And Lance Storm becomes my favorite wrestler of all time when he stops the worm from being executed. Um, <laughs> like, uh, I knew you'd appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it's just some fun little tag team stuff going on here. Nothing too impressive or worth noting. Once the worm gets stopped, uh, Christian hits the unprettier. Uh, Scotty Tuati and Albert are out. Next come up the Hardy Boys, Matt and Jeff. Uh, yep. Some more uh, tag team action between these guys. This is when the match starts really picking up. Uh, nothing too much here. Uh, Swanton Bomb eliminates Storm and Christian. As you see right here, it's rapid. It's fast. It's boom, boom, boom. This is the fast kind of tag team action they were looking for. And I think yep. I got the job done pretty well. In the first, you got six tag teams to go through. You don't want to drag it out too much. Mm-hmm. You might also notice when you're watching this match after the bell for Lance Storm and Christian, Christian is throwing a temper tantrum in the ring. This oh, is <laughs> this is precursor a precursor to that gimmick. Yeah, this is a precursor to that gimmick. So look out for that Easter egg. The next tag team in are the Dudley Boys. Of course, when you get the Dudleys and the Hardys in the same ring, it's probably going to be some good action. These two teams know each other very well. Um, oh yeah, that's why we wanted they wanted to get Storm and Christian and uh, Scotty Tuati and Albert out of the way so we can get to the real like meat of this match, which would, for the most part, be uh, Hardy Boys and Dudley Boys. This is where the pace really starts to slow down because you know you got those damn Dudleys. They like to make everything methodical. They want to slow it down to their pace. They don't want these little Hardy Boys flying around the ring, so they got to put a stop to that right away. Yeah, and you also mentioned that the Dudleys had Stacy Keebler as their valet at this point. Of course, she's out there with them here. The Hardy Boys had Lita in their corner. Um, there was a point where Stacy grabs Matt Hardy's hair on the apron, and then Lita comes in and evens the odds and starts fighting with Stacy Keebler. I wrote down where was Joey Styles to call that. Oh yeah, and two points I'm going to bring up about that. Number one, I don't think Stacy Keebler is as bad as everyone says she is. I really liked her as the Duchess of Dudleyville. I thought she played a very good heel and her and Lita actually had some couple of good spots in this match that I think are worth pointing out. It wasn't the usual cat fight, you know, pulling hair and screaming. There, there was some actual, Oh my God, women in wrestling. I, how, yep. how dare they? Lita um, hit a hurricane Rana on Bubba Ray at one point, which yeah, was really um, clean. But on the flip side, Oh my God. Remember this is 2002 commentary is pretty awful still. And I think at one point he asked JR if he can measure Stacey Keebler's legs. And I'm just like, oh, my God, Lawler. It was 2002. You can get away with that. It was. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is not the last time Jerry Lawler is all pervy on commentary this year. Either. Oh, but no. uh, anyway, there's a lot of really fast paced action between the two. And the ending between these two is kind of abrupt, which is kind of expected with this kind of a match. Matt Hardy rolls up Devon for the elimination. And I wrote down, why grab the tights? Your baby faces. <laughs> I didn't even notice that he grabbed the <laughs> like, tights. Matt Hardy grabs Devon's tights, and the Dudleys are not happy with this elimination. The Dudleys start beating them up after the bell and hit a really nice 3D on Jeff Hardy on the concrete, which leads to Billy and Chuck entering the match to pick up the scraps. It's pretty much just Matt fighting them two-on-one. Side effect on Chuck. A famous or by Billy, though. That eliminates the Hardys. That's yeah, it. that segment there didn't last too long, and I think it played very well to uh, Billy and Chuck. Remember, they're still trying to feel this tag team out. They're still trying to figure out how they gel with gel together really well. Um, but remember, they're heels, so they took advantage of Jeff being out, and they take out Matt pretty quickly. Uh, APA is out next. Um, Huge pop. Down. Uh, Billy and Chuck were a good team. I don't think people appreciate how solid of a tag team they were. Gimmick aside, shock value aside, this is before they even had Rico. I think Billy Gunn and Chuck Palumbo really clicked well with this team. They were so over. You know, there were, like, I mean, they were having a really nice little mini feud going on with the APA around this point, and sure enough, it comes down to these two. Um, Really stiff work in this last stretch. I forgot how stiff Billy Gunn was, was as a worker, but he is really, really solid. Um, there's heat on Farouk. Um, I wrote down that Billy's nose was bleeding at this point. I don't know how that happened, but uh, hot tag. Probably a of, stiff shot from Bradshaw. 
Probably, yeah. That leads to the finish, which was a really, really stiff clothesline from hell that turns Billy inside out. APA gets the pin and gets the tag team title shot at WrestleMania. I gave this match two and three quarters out of five. It was a really fun way to open the show. Um, the whole oh, yeah. term, I gave it, I gave it two and a half. Um, not in any bad way. I think it was fast. I think it was furious. I think it was fun tag team match. Uh, I don't, and I think it was the perfect time. It was short, but I think it needed to be short. I don't think it would have been a good idea to drag this match out longer than it needed to be. Yeah, it's nothing too spectacular about this match, but definitely some good work throughout. But I also don't think that we would ever see a gauntlet match go this short today. It only went 16 minutes. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. Uh, I think the fast and didn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of kind of cut out for a little bit there, but uh, – um, might, ju- might just be the Friday night internet over here, but uh, I apologize to the viewers in advance, but uh, here we go. So moving on, there's a backstage interview with Ric Flair about the NWO. It's basically calling them out, and he's interrupted by The Undertaker, which will be important later, and he basically calls himself the authority on respect, which is the big bill for his match with The Rock, which we'll talk oh, about yeah. in a little bit. Um, and our next match is what, my friend? Goldust versus RVD. Yeah, <laughs> this is a really strange pairing. Oh, yeah, and the buildup to this match was basically, and it's funny, I really enjoyed watching the buildup to this because it reminded me of a few Goldust would have eight years later. Goldust is talking about, he says he's going to get him, and we don't find out until two weeks before this pay-per-view that him is RVD. Why yeah. is it RVD? We don't know. Goldust is weird. He picked a target. For- Goldust would do something similar with Yossi Jr. and Maurice, where Goldust was talk, would constantly talk about, I want her, I want her. Did Yossi thought he was talking about Maurice? No. Goldust was talking about the Million Dollar Championship Bell. So I think that was fun that Goldust would recall one of his first feuds back in the WWE after returning. Because I think this was Goldust's first singles match back in the WWE when he returned. Yeah, I honestly uh, really forgot about that whole Ted DiBiase feud. But uh, yeah, exactly your point. This is like an old school gold dust mid '90s feud right here. Um, and why RVD? The announcers still are not sure. Um, but this match was. What did you think of it? What did you? Think I of thought this? it was pretty solid, all things considered. Um, this match starts out. Oh, and we're gonna get into a running theme with this uh, show. Goldust immediately takes RVD out of the ring. Um, good back and forth stuff. RVD is, remember, this is 2002, so RVD is firing on all cylinders, spin kicks, snap mares, spinning leg drops, cartwheels into moonsaults. Oh, yeah. You see RVD nowadays, and he's to 2001, and RVD just fires on all cylinders. Oh, yeah. it's uh, The crowd was solidly behind RVD. He was probably the most over new acquisition that the WWF got out of the invasion angle. Um, RVD hits a cartwheel moonsault at one point, which is a really, really neat move. Um, outside the ring, RVD sends Goldust over the barricade, and there is a really nice spinning leg drop while Goldust is draped over the barricade. Uh, I forgot how brutal that move is, not only for his opponent, but for RVD as well. Because not only does RVD get so much distance and twerk on that leg drop, nobody wins with that move, in my opinion. No, no, not at all. But it was all. always super fun to watch back in the day, that leg drop. Um, <laughs> Jerry Lawler actually has a really funny joke in this match, and I can't believe I'm going to point this out. But oh, no. he, 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 and I think you know, you know what I'm talking about. He tells JR, hey, did you hear about the man that froze to death at the drive-in movie? And JR says no. And Lawler said, yeah, he was watching Close for the Winner. Sometimes Jerry Lawler has good jokes. <laughs> Just gonna say that now. <laughs> I honestly forgot about that. I didn't even write that down. I must have missed it. But uh, when there's dead space in a match, when there's rest holds, when they need to take a break, Jerry Lawler every once in a while busts out a good joke. And I, I'm not gonna lie, I, I that got a chuckle out of me. I appreciate Jerry Lawler so much for that. But uh, Gold Dust slash Dustin Rhodes has some of the most crisp punches you'll ever see in this business. Uh, he hits a double axe handle to RVD on the outside, which looked really good. Um, he draped RVD's back over the top of the ring post, which could not have been comfortable. 
Um, slingshots RBD into the ropes. Uh, he's working over the back a little bit. Um, really nice work from them. Uh, there's a Harley race in knee, which gets two, and then we get the rest holes from Gold Dust. It's kind of slow with RBD on the defense. Yeah, it, you look at it, these are two different styles. Uh, you have RBD, obviously, with his athletic style. Um, Gold Dust is still wrestling these matches a lot like his dad. He is definitely slowing down the pace. He is doing, you know, the double axe handles, the bionic elbows, the really old school, old school style. Uh, some people might think this clashes. I think it works really well because RBD is getting all of his fun flips and dives in there. And when the match really needs to slow down and the psychology comes in it, no one better than Dustin Rhodes when it comes to that. Absolutely, for sure. I wrote down... Rhodes also has this really nasty move that he does twice to RBD. It's a slingshot, and RBD's throat hits the ropes and then lands on Goldust's knees. His back lands on his... And Goldust hits this move twice in the same match. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was... I, I think I... Uh... Yeah, slingshots RBD into the ropes, and yeah, exactly to your point. Yeah, RBD bounces off the ropes, and he basically ricochets into Goldust knees, which are pretty much up, like at a, like I, I don't know how to describe it. It's They're almost bridged. like a, yeah, it's yeah. bridged, like a ninety degree angle to the floor, basically. Um, RBD starts his comeback. It's a really nice comeback. Um, springboard Van Daminator and a Rolling Thunder both get near falls. There is a really, really uh, nice counter wrestling from Goldust during this comeback. This is where I really think this match really picks up. Uh, Rob Van Dam misses the five star, and Goldust hits a really sick looking DDT, and that's a very close near fall at that point. I honestly oh, thought yeah. Goldust had won, but this uh, is probably the only yeah the only downside. After that, RVD just hits the five star, and the match kind of just ends. It's kind of just like okay, we got our stuff in. Time to take this home. Um, this wasn't a bad match, actually. I give it three stars. I just feel like it had a lot of underappreciated wrestling, a lot of underappreciated stuff from RVD, and kind of an underappreciated wrestling style, an old-school wrestling style that Goldust was trying to do that I feel like would just go underappreciated in that time in 2002. Yeah, I agree with you. I gave this match two and three-quarter stars. It felt like your above-average match on Raw. Um... It, the work was good, but the crowd just was not that overly invested in this match, Un at least until RVD's comeback, which was really solid. Um, some really good near falls, which I was really surprised. I like this match a lot more than I remembered. Um, it was definitely a match designed to put over Rob Van Dam. Um, it's not a bad match at all. I didn't mind it. It was just a little bit too predictable because RVD was getting a lot of momentum here and Gold Dust was kind of the KG veteran that was putting people oh, yeah. over at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. Also, Gold Dust is the heel. This is honestly looks a lot also like a house show match. You go to the house show, you, you don't want to see the heel go over. You want to send the fan, fans ha home happy with some matches. So this is the one you give the bone to the baby face. You make the yeah. fans happy. Yeah, which isn't a bad thing at all. Um, so after this, we get our first backstage segment with the New World Order. Would you mind describing this to the viewers, Tomas? Oh, yes. We have Stone Cold Steve Austin getting ready for his WWF Championship match. He is confronted by the NWO, who tried to give him a offering. And Austin says the words that I hear him say in my life. I'm not thirsty. Which basically translates to, I do not trust <laughs> you. I will not take your beer. Scott Hall then said, save it for later. Austin takes the beer pack and throws it on the ground. Something I never thought I'd see in my life. Kind of gold for sure. But again, this is a weird iteration of the New World Order that isn't there to take over. I feel like the WCW New World Order would have just attacked Austin right there. But, oh, yeah. you know, it, it is what it is. Our next match, the WWF Tag Team title match, not involving any established tag teams really from the turmoil match we were talking about. It is the champions Taz and Spike Dudley versus the challengers Booker T and Test. Wow, did uh someone go on to smack bring it and just generate a random tag team match? Definitely saying that out loud. This that's what it looks like. Yep, you know, <laughs> and like one of the big storylines in the SmackDown just bring it story mode, if you guys remember, Vince, like first thing he does is offer a tag team and you have a bunch of like random choices that you can pick from you know in that free realm and that's exactly what this felt like it's funny because tomas and i were kind of like joking about this after the rumble review how random taz and spike are booker t and Tess, i feel like are just as random and it kind of became this contest where we were trying to one-up each other about who can think of the most random tag team 
And there's definitely a lot of random tag teams, even I completely forgot about. Oh, yeah. And we'll, I'll be sure to mention the one that had Tomas in tears when we get to that point. But uh, in any regard, um, Booker T and Tess, I also read up, are former tag team champions themselves. What? They won the tag team titles before? Yeah. They, they Please were... explain. Was this during the invasion angle and I just don't remember? Was it one of those tag team – was one of those title reigns that literally lasted maybe two or three days? Yep. Yep. They were – I think they were actually two-time champions. <laughs> like... Oh, that – if there's one thing – okay, this is going to go off on a quick tangent. If there's one thing I cannot stand, probably about the years – you know, I'm going to give 98. No, 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 no. I'm going to 98 through 2001. There were too many title changes, too many champions. Everyone held the belt. Even if it was only for a week, I can't stand that. I hate that. I'm so glad it's at least not a thing anymore. And I'm so glad at least what's not a thing, yeah. even in 2002. Yeah. I, I can't stand that. It's just like, it, it was shock TV. I wasn't even watching back then, but watching those old pay-per-views. Yeah. You basically, yeah. for example... I'm not saying this is exactly what happened. It's like you have a pay-per-view and it's Val Venus versus Rikishi for the Intercontinental title. And you found out on Monday Night Raw that Venus just won the Intercontinental title with us and Rikishi wins the Intercontinental title at the pay-per-view. And then the very next night on Raw, he drops the title to Test and then Test drops the title to Eddie Guerrero on SmackDown. It's just like, come on, pick a champion. You're changing, you're, you're changing the title just for the sake of changing the title. You got to remember who was booking the show around that point. Now, bro, it's, it's let me so let me make one thing perfectly clear. The title changes allow for the more predictable television, bro. And we got to, you know what, bro? We got to get them ratings, bro. That's my terrible Vince Russo nuts. impression. But uh, nuts during the watching old pay per views when the network first came out. Again, so we started watching in two thousand two. So, of course, I want to watch all the old pay-per-views and seeing how inconsistent every single pay-per-view was back in the day. Just like what I like to say about the Attitude Era, which is probably going to anger a lot of people, the main event stuff was good. Everything else was crap. Everything else was crap, huh? Yeah, every, it was... That is another rant for another time, though. Anywho, yeah. back to this tag team title match. So far, second match in a row, and this is going to become an ongoing theme, Test and Booker attack Spike and Taz like right before the match starts, right at its beginning. And again, I'm going to jump the gun a little. This happens a lot in this pay-per-view. I yep. think except for maybe the main event, either someone attacks someone from behind or they immediately jump in the ring and start brawling. It's to the point where you expect it. And I feel like that's another Russo decision right there. It's just like, oh, just jump the opponent first thing. It's like, are, are lockups not a thing anymore? I mean, yeah. Pro wrestling, not a thing anymore. Anywho, maybe I'm going, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. Ah, but that's all that's one thing I noticed right away from that match. Um, fast and furious stuff right there. Spike hits a nice missile drop kick. Spike is on the defensive. And I feel like the theme of this match is Test and Booker making sure Spike does not get the tag to Taz. Because mm -hmm. they know if Taz gets the tag, they have a chance. If they take out, if they divide and conquer, if they eliminate Spike right now, then there's no chance that Spike and Taz are going to win the tag team titles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And when the hot tag to Taz does come around, who runs wild for a little bit, the crowd is dead silent. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, definitely not over with that WWF crowd. The crowd did not really care about this match. Uh, but Taz's comeback was at least decent. A doubly dog on Tess hits two. Uh, Tess tries pinning Taz with his feet on the ropes, but the referee, Jack Doan, catches him. And Tess, you remember, is Mr. Immunity at this point. He can't be fired. That's his whole gimmick. So Tess, pretty much the finish is he shoves the referee. Jack Doan shoves him right back, and Tess's momentum carries him into the Taz mission. Tess taps out. I thought that was a pretty creative finish. It was only oh, a yeah. seven-minute seven, seven minute match. I gave it two stars out of five. A creative finish, but this is the very definition of average. Oh, yeah. I gave it two and a quarter. Um, believe it or not, I liked it more than the Dudley Boys match at the Royal Rumble. Not only did this match go longer, I feel like – this had a little more to it. And say what you want about Test and Booker being the randomest team in the world. They actually had some good chemistry. I actually did note a couple of good double-team offensive moves they had on Spike Dudley. Um, so definitely not the worst match in the world, but definitely filler at the same time. Um, you're probably going to have to remind me going into WrestleMania. I assume Spike and Taz just randomly dropped the titles on Raw before Mania because I do not remember Spike and Taz. 
going into Mania as the champions. Nope, they don't. They actually would lose the tag team titles on the next episode of SmackDown to Billy and Chuck. Oh, okay. So Billy and so Chuck over. going to. Yep, Billy and Chuck are the defending champions going into WrestleMania. This is one of the last defenses we'll see of Taz and Spike. And I believe Taz retired in the ring um, at some point after this, and he became a full-time color commentator on SmackDown. Yes. But yeah. uh, um, after this, we get an interview with The Rock, who always seems to be interviewed by Jonathan Coachman around this point. And it's usually filled with the comedy where it's like, my favorite line is, would you like to see Coach dance the Charleston? But we get none of that here. The Rock is completely serious. He is talking about how he's been holed up at home thanks to The Undertaker with a massive kayfabe concussion. And he's basically just ready to go for this match. Intense Rock here. Yeah, very solid promo by The Rock. Rock just talking about how he's been thinking for the past 10 days, how Undertaker has attacked him. And in no way he thinks that he has disrespected The Undertaker. But if Undertaker wants to feel that, that's when, you know, they get in the ring and they get it on. Rock is ready for this match. Next up is a fun little gimmick match. It's a brass knuckles on a pole match for the Intercontinental Championship. Edge is challenging William Regal. As you remember, last month at the Royal Rumble, Regal used the power of the punch, the brass knuckles, to win the Intercontinental Championship. So basically, to even the playing field, we are going to have a brass knuckles on a pole match. Would you like to explain how this match works? Yeah. So, yeah, speaking of Vince Russo specials, so basically how this match works is it's kind of like a ladder match in some ways. But instead of the objects hanging down from the center of the ring from above the ceiling, there is a gigantic steel pole that's stationed to one of the ring posts. And the knucks are on top of that. And the guys basically have to climb the turnbuckles to grab the knucks. And the first one to grab said brass knuckles is able to use them in this match. So no disqualifications, no countouts, um, only pinfall or submission. So before we get into this actual match, I have a kind of a legitimate gripe when it comes to matches like this. And this will definitely play into the ending of this match. Number one, some inconsistencies. So you can use a pair of brass knucks, but are other weapons not legal? I feel like they never make that point clear. We definitely see some inconsistencies in the future. Like, for example, Batista and The Undertaker at TLC 2009. match. Where Batista wins with a low blow, but Teddy Long comes out and reverses it. So, like, you can't use a low blow. You can only use a steel chair. This point will brought up later into the match, but I just feel like it, it, it's not clear right off the bat. Um, so, Regal, no. yeah. so, sorry to cut you off, but like if Edge hypothetically used a steel chair in this match, does that mean he gets DQ'd? Exactly. They don't make these rules. I know the match what? is supposed to revolve around the brass knucks, but can you or can you not? And remember, JR makes a good point. You don't even need to retrieve the brass knuckles to win the match. So Edge and Regal could wrestle a completely normal match, not even get the brass knuckles, and they could still win. Yeah. But at the same time, this feud is revolved around the brass knuckles. So if you're Edge and Regal, if you're Edge who wants to get revenge on Regal for using the knucks, and if you're Regal who is a coward and who cannot win without the knucks, why would you not be going for the knucks? Right. And that kind of takes some of the drama out of this match, too, because you know there's no way that this match is going to end without somebody climbing up to get the knuckles and like you know once that happens you'll realize that the finish is coming pretty soon but uh oh yeah given, given this stipulation i feel like these two did a hell of a job i thought edge was even more intense in this match than he was at the rumble um uh going into it i feel like it was a lot more slower paced um of course it's a lot of regal and edge immediately going for the brass knuckles and a lot of outside work uh it's a lot of defense like edge throwing over regal over the barricade and then him going for the knucks um, Regal definitely slows down this pace with a abdominal stretch, showing more of his brilliant wrestling. Yep. Uh, brilliant wrestling moves in this match. There's a Regal uh, sucks chant at that point, and I wrote down, I disagree. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, oh, a nasty spot where Regal shoves Edge off the top rope mm. into the barricade. Definitely yeah. worth noticing. And then also a really nasty spot where, well, first of all, Regal hits a tiger bomb on the outside, which looked pretty good. Yeah. Regal goes for a power bomb off the apron and edge is supposed to counter it into a hurricane rana but he botches it pretty bad and edge and regal take a nasty fall to the ground and i'm yeah. probably got my yeah. my spots mixed up i believe that was before the tiger bomb spot but i do remember regal trying to power bomb edge off the apron and it did not end well for either of them this match was definitely very stiff um edge um there's a regal stretch at some point and that's where i noticed that edge was bleeding from the mouth 
Um, that might have came from the spot you mentioned earlier where Edge is pushed off the ropes um, into the barricade. I'm not entirely sure where the bleeding came from, but uh, I um, Regal hits a tiger bomb inside the ring for a near fall. And I just got to say, I really loved how William Regal executed his pinfall attempts because he literally, he doesn't just like, you know, he's not just like on top of the other opponent, but he literally puts his forearm in his opponent's face. You oh, know, yeah, like definitely, just definitely good thing to point out lethal. Regal right there. Yeah. Regal uh, finally retrieves the brass nuts, but Edge is able to grab him at the last second and do a back superplex, taking both superstars out. It's a race for the nuts. They are both reaching for the nuts. And, you know, it's like it's that a great when you're shot. Trying to reach for the, yeah, when you're trying to reach for the cage door, all of a sudden their legs are broken. They're numb. They have to crawl towards these nuts. Um, yep. At this point, I believe Edge kicks the Regal out of the ring. Uh, oh, no, no, Regal, Regal, kicks Regal them kicked them out of the ring because Edge had his fingertips on them. And then Edge hits a really nice edge of Matic for a near fall. It leads to some really nice counter wrestling. And Edge hits a spear, but he doesn't go for a cover. He goes outside and he gets the brass knuckles. Um, but William Regal, that little snake, as we mentioned in the Rumble review, he, of course, brought some brass knuckles of his own. I guess Jimmy Corderas did not frisk him as much as Nick Patrick did a month before. Uh, power of the punch by Regal, bloody's edge even more, and that's it after about 10 minutes of action. To be honest, I gave this match three and a quarter stars out of five. Given the limitations that this match had, these two did a hell of a job. This was the best match of the night so far. Really stiff work. It felt like a fight and the true end of a feud. Okay, here we go. This is where I come to disagree. I gave this match two stars. And really? Here's my issues with the match. Number one, I actually think I thought the Royal Rumble match was better. I just felt like this match was a little slower, a little clunkier, a little botchier, and the stipulation didn't really help as well, like I said, with inconsistencies. Here's my biggest issue with this match. So you mean to tell me, and JR, even Bright, JR and Jerry Lawler have kind of bicker over this over commentary. So JR says that Regal cheated because he used a pair of brass nuts. Jerry Law, no, brass knucks are legal. <laughs> and JR says, not those brass knucks. Why does it matter which brass knucks? <laughs> and that's what I hated about this match. <laughs> to me, if brass knucks are illegal, I'm going to have to agree with the heel on this one. It does not matter what pair of brass knucks. I know they want you to use those brass knucks. Yeah. They use a pair of brass knucks. So it should not matter. This isn't, in my opinion, this isn't a case of, oh, the heel got around the rules again. If anything, Regal was being smart. He yeah. knew his brass knuckles were illegal in this match. And just because he didn't use the ones, what happened if he would have got caught? Would he got disqualified? It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Like, what happens if Edge uses a chair? Just bringing it back to that point, would the announcers have said that Edge cheated? You know, like, you yeah, make a so really great point. There was a lot of inconsistencies in this match, and it didn't help me and Bocce. So, not a huge fan of this match. I gave it two stars. Um... Yeah, I, I like the Royal match more. I really liked this match. I thought this was honestly their best match of their trilogy. I thought it was the most stiffly worked. I It felt like, you know, it had, I don't know. I mean, aside from, I'm not going to like, you know, downgrade the match personally just because the commentators are pointing out the flaws, but I don't know. It's, I, Regal's a wily veteran. Again, I had to agree with the heel on this one. He could use those brass knuckles. And I feel like if regardless... William Regal would have used him anyway because he's that little snake. I'm going to go back to that quote you used, my friend. He's the little snake. Oh, yeah. um, it was a – I thought this was a better match than I remembered. I feel like this would have been an amazing match if it got more time. Um, oh, yeah, and if it didn't have the the, the, t- the terrible gimmick attached to it. I mean, you could have just had, like, a normal, like, I don't know, like a no disqualification match or something like that or, like, a first blood match even I would have yeah, taken. I, I, but... I understand why the brass ducks – it was part of the feud. I understand why they needed to be there. It's kind of like the year before with Chris Jericho and William Regal. You know, it, it was that was all about Regal writing, <laughs> screwing the rules into his favor. And the I Duchess. Think, again, yeah. I, I think Regal told a very good story with this match, but there was just something about the gimmick, the way it was executed, and the fact that the match was pretty clunky. Uh, just it just it just definitely bogged it down for me. That's fair. Yeah, you know I. You know, I agree to disagree. Hey, that's a that's a great thing about this. You know, we don't have oh, yeah. to have the same opinions. It's subjective. Oh, yeah, but, and it uh, sparked some very fun debates. Exactly, yeah. You know, I personally, I thought this was, this was actually, in my opinion, the second best match on the entire show. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, 
the next segment is something. Would you like to describe this, Tomas? Because I know you. Lily been Garcia to... is interviewing Kurt Angle about his upcoming match with Triple H, and <laughs> she asked him if he is happy that Stephanie McMahon is the special guest referee. Angle says he is happy, but not because Stephanie is the ref. He says that he is confident that he will beat Triple H all by himself. And as we'll bring up with the pregnancy angle, he is happy that Triple H and Stephanie aren't actually having a baby because Triple H would have made a lousy father. And tonight, Kurt Angle is going to be his daddy. Oh, Kurt Angle is a national treasure. One of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Probably Easily probably breaks my top five. Um, just because he can turn the goofiest little angle into just gold, no pun intended. Um, and speaking of, he was wearing the gold medals around his neck. And this leads to my favorite line in this entire promo. He tells Lillian, I didn't get these from a box of lucky freaking charms. I love that. <laughs> Kurt Angle, anyone who tells me Kurt Angle is not a national treasure, you are dead wrong. But anyway, um, the next I'm match. Not, I, real quick, I'm not looking forward to uh, going, reviewing his uh, 2005 rivalry with booker t i'm not looking forward to that just saying that right now no me neither but uh, in any case um our next match we have is the rock versus the undertaker two of my favorite wrestlers ever um the rock this this whole feud is basically built around so this is actually a pretty strange little storyline they have going on the rock um so i actually was watching some of the build as well and the night after the royal rumble the rock pinned Chris Jericho, the undisputed champion, in a tag match. WWE logic nowadays would mean that The Rock would get the title shot at this show, but it turned out that there was a little mini tournament and that he had to earn his way through number one contenders matches to get there. And his first match on SmackDown against Kurt Angle, The Undertaker cost him the match. Reason being is because The Rock was basically talking all this trash about how great the Royal Rumble was. And he mentions the Undertaker being eliminated by Maven. And the Funny Undertaker... how this feud was sparked by Maven eliminating Undertaker, but Maven is nowhere to be seen. Nope. And Maven actually won the hardcore title in the build-up to this, thanks to The Rock. And he pinned the Undertaker. Again, fluky win. Um, and the Undertaker was so pissed off about this that afterwards... He tombstones The Rock on top of a limousine, which is a really, really neat spot on SmackDown. And that's what leads to The Rock's kayfabe concussion, and therefore we have the match we're getting here. The Rock sprints and to the I ring. I was just going to say, <laughs> before I even got a second to bring up, oh, here comes the theme of this pay-per-view again, The Rock sprints like a linebacker to the ring. Thank goodness Undertaker got his full entrance because if it wasn't, The Rock was in the ring in a millisecond. And this match starts right away, I, right there. Uh, Rock getting his signature punches in, his slobber punch. This match is all over the place. If there's yep. one thing I'm going to say about this match right now, there was definitely not a dull moment in this match. So I'm going to disagree with you here. I thought the match had a really, really fast start. I really like how The Rock sprinted to the ring because this is a very personal rivalry. If you guys recall Survivor Series 2000, he did the same exact thing in his match against Rikishi. He just sprinted to the ring, and he didn't give the crowd his full entrance. And that's how you know the Rock meant business tonight. Usually, today's WWE, the Rock would have made his full entrance like nothing was going on. But um, great selling of the concussion by the Rock. And Take is really working over that concussion in this match. I really like the psychology, but... The Undertaker has taken The Rock to Chinlock City for a majority of this, and it's actually kind of boring at some and point. And before it gets to that point, I got to point out, Rock hit the worst neckbreaker I've ever seen in my life. And the commentators even point out that The Rock did not get all of that neckbreaker. I always feel like that's the classic commentator's way of talking out of a box. Oh, he didn't get all of that neckbreaker. He didn't get any of that neckbreaker. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, yeah, he didn't get any of that neck breaker. Might have been a little miscommunication there. The Rock and The Undertaker didn't exactly have the best in-ring chemistry together. I always thought The Undertaker worked better with smaller opponents. Um, and The Rock is definitely not a smaller opponent. Um, big 275-pound Haas back in 2002. Um, he's still a big 275-pound Haas these days. But uh, in any regard, um, there's a bit of a brawl into the crowd. And Mike Kyoto is very, very forgiving of this match with the DQs and the countouts. And that's what I really hated about it. I, I was going to bring that up too. Again, 
I know everything is different nowadays when it comes to matches being structured like this. And if this was a world title match, I may have been able to forgive it. Forgive because I noticed when they do this in world title matches, the commentators also have another good cover-up line. It's, oh, the referee is giving a lot of leeway to these guys. This is a world championship match. We don't want it to end on a count out. But this is a regular match. There's no sick. Yeah. What yeah. reason would the ref have to let Rock and Undertaker go all the way to almost the concourse? Yeah. Without and even counting to one. I was scared they were going to start brawling in the backstage area because then I'm thinking like, no, this isn't a false count anywhere match. You can't just allow that. I understand it because, oh, these are the two big stars. We got to, you know, we don't want to bog the bow down by rules. But at the same time, what's the point of having a count out rule if you're not yeah. going to implement that rule? Exactly. That's exactly what I wrote down. That's my biggest problem with this match. Why is this not false count anywhere? I feel like this is a match that warrants that kind of stipulation and it allows for those callbacks later on. You know, they could go out to the parking lot with the limousine and the Rock can hit a rock bottom on Taker on the limo. But anyway, um, the Rock gets crotched up on the barricade. Um, again, they're brawling through the crowd and Mike Kyoto stays with them the entire time. He does not count them out. And it's funny how you bring that up, because how is it that Rock and Undertaker are all over the place, but later on in the main event, Stone Cold Steve Austin, of all people, is able to keep his world title match with Chris Jericho in the ring. If anyone's going to be doing the outside brawling, you'd think it would be Austin. There but you no, go. They're able to keep theirs Chris clean wrestling match, and Rock and Undertaker, I feel like, yes, I'd, I'd be able I'd give this match a little more credit if this would have been like a no-hold-barred match. Exactly, yeah. Or even a last man standing match, which I'm not even a fan of to begin with, just because yeah. it's not nearly as exciting as like a normal false count anywhere. Yeah. But like in, in in the era of gimmick matches and stipulation matches up the wazoo, you think they would have taken advantage of that? You know, again, like I said at the beginning of this review, Rock and Undertaker could be a WrestleMania match. But at the same time, you don't need a reason to give these guys a no hold barred match. It's still post attitude era you could have just said rock and taker hit each other no holds barred it's the same issue i had with triple h and undertaker from the year prior that was a wrestler regular wrestling match too and they wrestled all the way up a scaffolding with the referee yeah. knocked yeah. out and they didn't do anything about that that's an another match that could have benefited from the no holds yeah. barred stipulation but here's the difference i actually really enjoyed that match for like everything like their whole product that Triple H and Undertaker put out at WrestleMania the year before because the stuff in the ring was actually interesting between the two and it wasn't boring the Undertaker like hits a vicious DDT for a near fall and then he just puts the rock in the longest bear hug I've ever seen in my life like yes I definitely mean, this match would not have picked up into the end which has started getting interesting we having you know definitely run-ins can get old after a while but i think this the run-ins for this match definitely helped not only get things interesting again but it definitely played into the storylines because first you had vince mcmahon who came out and because he's advocating for the undertaker he still doesn't like the rock rock throws him into the ring starts punching him takes him out and then while his back is turned undertaker has the lead pipe that he always uses and then rick flair appears hits taker with the lead pipe Rock bottom, rock wins. You know, again, the match was pretty underwhelming. Yeah. Considering yeah. it was the Rock versus The Undertaker. Um, I gave it three stars just because I feel like the fast pace, and even though I disagreed with it, the outside brawling was good. It just had no reason to it. Um, this match didn't exist to be Rock versus Undertaker. It existed to start the feud that was Undertaker and Ric Flair or continue it. And that's my yeah. biggest problem with this. You know, this should have just merely been about Undertaker versus The Rock and not necessarily about Vince McMahon versus Ric Flair for the bajillionth time. You know, like, and again, all these run-ins would have made more sense with the stipulation. The Undertaker could have grabbed the lead pipe and the referee wouldn't have, like, you know, had to take a ref bump or anything like that or be distracted somehow. But, yeah. Like, Undertaker goes and grabs a lead pipe. Ric Flair runs in, and he basically... Undertaker goes for a tombstone. Flair hits Taker with the pipe. And The Rock hits the rock bottom, which the match, I'll actually give credit, did not end with a people's elbow. The rock bottom is the more devastating finisher. I gave the match two and three-quarter stars out of five. This was a pretty boring match for a lot of it. Like, I feel like it picked up with the run-ins, and I feel like it definitely should not have, you know, been about 
Ric Flair versus Undertaker. I get why they did it, but at the same time, it's like, I wish it was about Rock versus Taker. The brass knuckles on a pole match, I think, was better than this. I can definitely see where you're coming from there, wrestling-wise. Um, this is the definition of, you see it on paper, it's like, wow, The Undertaker versus The Rock, and it just really didn't deliver. It, it's like, it wasn't, again, it was not about Undertaker and Rock. It was no. about everybody except The Rock. It was about Taker. It was about Vince. It was about Flair. And, you know, and, and this would, you know, at least be a good precursor for what's going to happen in a following segment that happens later in the night because you're wondering, well, what's next for The Rock? You know what Undertaker's going to do. You know what Flair is going to do. You even know what Vince is going to do to a certain extent. But The Rock's one of the biggest stars in the company. What are you going to do with him? But we're going to find out what they do with The Rock. The Rock felt like an afterthought in this whole thing. Like, that's, like, The Rock is my favorite wrestler of all time, as I mentioned. The Undertaker, one of my top favorites for sure. These two just never had the best chemistry in the ring. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was just, like, The Undertaker works better with smaller opponents, even though Triple H isn't really that small of an opponent, and I've praised his matches with him. But, like, I don't know, man. This was – Rob Van Dam versus Goldust, I think, was better than this. Oh, yeah. Wrestling-wise, this was not the best. Yeah. Uh, like, again, a, a stipulation definitely would have helped with this match. But uh, was that Rock segment next, or did it go straight into the, the number one contenders match? I believe there was a short little segment at WWF New York with Mr. Perfect. Rest in peace. It was... Uh, oh, yeah. It was, I, I forgot about it because it was awkward. and Kind of a Kurt weird Hennig, segment. Kurt Hennig, at his age, is still trying to show off. He doesn't have the Mr. Perfect bod. He has the dad bod now. And he definitely reminds me a lot of uh, British Bulldog, which, you know, bless his heart. Yeah. The way he was looking before he passed. And unfortunately, Kurt Hennig would pass away pretty soon after this this, this pay-per-view. Yeah, it's it's very unfortunate. And, like, I, I almost wish that they would have, like, done more with Mr. Perfect around this point. But it's unfortunate. But, yeah. That brings us to our next point, the number one contenders match. Uh, winner goes on to WrestleMania to take on the Undisputed Champion. Triple H versus Kurt Angle. Special guest referee is Stephanie McMahon. And the first thing we find out when she is getting introduced, uh, she is still being introduced as Stephanie McMahon Helmsley. But as you know, Triple H and Stephanie are soon going to divorce. So Stephanie is sure to go out of her way to tell Howard Finkel to introduce her as Stephanie McMahon. As she would keep yeah. that name. To this day, um, to kind of bring up the mood a little, unlike the last match, I think this gimmick and this stipulation played perfectly in the story that they were trying to tell. Uh, Triple H had won the Royal Rumble in the previous month, and because of what she did to Stephanie and to Vince, basically during that wedding, Stephanie and Vince are forcing Triple H to put his world title match on the line against Kurt Angle. Basically, they're ready for this match. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel I think this match was actually made before all this marriage stuff went down, and Stephanie was established as the guest referee after the wedding. Um, but this is already my first problem with this match. I thought Triple H and Kurt Angle always had really good chemistry together, but they were always bogged down from having an instant classic match by some weird-ass gimmick. And this is another one of those examples, I think. This was more. I personally liked this match a lot more than I definitely liked it more than Rock versus Taker. This is that this was my favorite match. Absolutely, just because I think everyone played their part pretty well. Of course, Stephanie is trying to screw over Kurt Angle, so she's Kurt Angle Triple H, so she's doing the classic when Angle gets the pin, fast count kick out. When Triple H gets the pin, of course it's uh, oh she Jr has a great line saying like Stephanie was counting Triple H's feet, not his shoulders. But yep. when uh, when Triple H gets the pin, it's, ow, my wrist hurts. Or something that gets in the way of Stephanie trying to get the pin. Uh, Triple H gets in Stephanie's face at this point, And Angle goes for a clothesline to Triple H. But Triple H ducks and, and nails Stephanie. I'm going to say this right now. The McMahon family can't sell for shit because this, Stephanie sold this, this like shit. Now, that was a... That was one of the biggest pops of the match, though. Sorry to cut you off, but, like, yeah, the clothesline over the top the rope. clothesline. She bounces off the ropes, and then she has to, like, awkwardly put herself over the top rope, and then she lands on her feet, and then she has to act knocked out. She Again, has to, like, sit down on the outside. Yeah. The crowd goes nuts for it because they hate Stephanie. And also a very awkward take-her-shirt-off chant. 
like, oh my God, that would not slide today. But back in 2002, uh, I guess it did. <laughs> I, I, did you I hear did, that? I did not hear that, actually. I'm oh, yeah, they were chanting out, it. So. And then JR didn't say they were chanting it, but he did say, wow, she looks like this crowd wants Stephanie to take her shirt off. And I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> we are in definitely in different times. Uh, yep, absolutely. Um, I think it's also worth noting that Stephanie McMahon, the referee, is cheering Kurt Angle this entire time, every time he's on offense. I, I wish I had a soundboard, but in the words of Chris Jericho, you're a shitty referee. <laughs> but uh, See, and this is what I mean. I think Stephanie played her part very well in this match to definitely tell a good story in this match. Uh, but when she is taken out, um, a horde of referees comes out to help her out. Tim White comes in to take her place, and that's when the, definitely the pace of this match slows down, and we definitely get more of the wrestling aspect for this match. And that's mm -hmm. why I like the story that was told in this match, that it was able to tell, like, oh, here's Stephanie trying to screw over Triple H. But they're able to remove her for the, from the equation for a bit so Triple H and Angle can get some of their stuff in. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, referee Tim White takes over. And like I said, Kurt Angle and Hunter have really good chemistry in the ring. Um, when they're not bogged down by a stupid gimmick, I feel like they can have an instant classic, or they could have had um kurt angle belly to belly souffle three straight near falls um i, I wrote down souffle for some reason i don't know why um kurt angle eventually gets a sleeper hold um yeah the match is kind of slow triple h it's a really beautiful spine buster for a near fall kurt angle is chased around the ring and angle intentionally knocks out tim white so there's your second referee bump of the match i think it's there where JR has another good line saying, it's not a good night for the Zebras. All the referees are getting knocked out left and right. No, yeah. Kurt Angle hits a low blow, of course, undetected by the ref, who he just knocked out. He hits an angle slam on Hunter, and that's when Steph runs back out from the uh, from the locker room. Three straight near falls. I think Steph's counts were getting increasingly faster. Um, and then Kurt Angle gets the straps down, and he locks in the ankle lock. And that's when we get yet another Stephanie ref bump. Triple H kicks out of the ankle lock. He kicks Kurt into Steph. Um, Stephanie also <laughs> sold that like shit. Just had to point that out. This match is absolute chaos. DDT on Kurt. He has a pinfall on him. There's no referee. He's pinning Kurt forever. Triple H tries reviving Tim White. Um, he angle, angle like decks Triple H with either a punch or an elbow, and Triple H just falls back into Tim White. Another ref bump. That's like four. <laughs> For those of you keeping score, like, um, Kurt Angle tries a tear shot. He misses. Triple H hits a pedigree. Um, Tim White makes his way. He comes to. He slowly counts one, two. And then, and then Stephanie hits the elbow drop on White. <laughs> that <laughs> God, is this match hilarious. ever going to end? It was hilarious because like, Stephanie even did the whole <laughs> right before she hits the elbow. Yeah. And nothing sure. against Stephanie. But she's, like, tiny at this point in her life. So I don't understand how her little elbow can knock out the ref. But it and, does. <laughs> and Tim White had to sell that like he's been shot by a cannon. And Stephanie takes Tim White to Dick Kick City shortly afterwards. <laughs> like, and, and this is where Triple H tries a pedigree on his own wife, Stephanie. And that leads to Kurt Angle blatantly hitting Triple H in the back with a chair. And then he hits the angle slam. That's a three count from Stephanie at the 14-minute mark. Why? So, Angle wins. And remember the stipulation of this match. Angle gets Triple H's world title match at WrestleMania. So, me not really remembering what happened after this pay-per-view, because I, you know, obviously the main event is Triple H versus Chris Jericho for the undisputed title. I looked up on Wikipedia how Triple H got his title match back, and apparently he wins it back the very next night on Raw. So what was the point of Angle winning this match if Triple H was going to win his title back, title shot the next night on Raw, and just go to WrestleMania like nothing happened? This is a WCW finish in 2002. I'm sorry. This is like a way to get the audience to tune in. I feel like I, I gave this match three and a quarter stars. Great work in the match. I hated the booking of this match. And like, this actually makes me think of an interesting question. Would you think that the Mania main event would have been like – better as a triple threat with Jericho as the tweener champion and Kurt Angle having Stephanie at his side? I definitely agree. Um, and I feel like if they were going to put Angle over, they, you know, might as well put him in a triple threat. It reminds me of 
WrestleMania 22 years later, Randy Orton did the same thing to Rey Mysterio, and it became a triple threat. Not Ironic. saying Kurt Angle and Rey Mysterio wouldn't have been a good match, but definitely putting Orton in there as the X Factor helped help that match tremendously. And I feel like, again, if Angle was going to win the match, why did he have nothing to do with the world title WrestleMania? He would mm-hmm. end up working Kane at WrestleMania, and nothing against Kane, but how do you go from possibly being in the main event at the pay-per-view prior, and then a week later losing that title shot, and then a couple weeks later getting into a feud with Kane, and then your involvement in WrestleMania having nothing to do with what you were doing the month prior. Yeah, so I guess what happens is a uh, really great point. So, like you said, Kurt Angle loses to Triple H the next night on Raw. Triple H is back in the main event. whoop de doo The next SmackDown, what happens is Kurt Angle comes out at the top of the show. He's pissed off about what's gone down. He calls it a travesty. <laughs> like, like, this wasn't an unfair travesty. And he calls out anyone from the back. And Kane answers his open challenge. And Kurt proceeds to destroy Kane. Um, and Kane ends up costing Kurt Angle his eventual undisputed title shot on Raw. <laughs> like, you know, Kurt, like, wins this match. He loses against Triple H the next night. And he gets an undisputed title match anyway. <laughs> like, He's definitely booking all over the place. It's like they didn't know what they wanted from this uh, I agree. I do think the match would have benefited more with Angle being in the main event and just giving, if they wanted Kane to work Mania, they definitely couldn't give him, him another opponent. Kevin uh, Nash. Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash. Exactly. You know, exactly. I, that would have been an interesting, I feel like would have been an interesting dynamic. Kane would have gotten involved with the NWO early. I think he could have brought in X-Pac at that point, but this is not a rebooking of WrestleMania 18 at this point, but I feel like that main event would have been a lot better with Jericho not having Stephanie at the side, which did not make any sense. Um, I was actually, it's funny because I was reading Jericho's book, uh, his second book the other day. And I read that the original pitch for this match, uh, this program with Triple H was that he was like, he was going to show Triple H like some like videotape footage of a guy with a ponytail having an affair with Stephanie in the back. And he was going to frame RVD for that to get RVD kind of like involved in this whole drama. But turns out that the ponytail in the footage was in fact, Chris Jericho. And it oh, would have been so... like a swerve, I guess, but uh-huh, uh-huh. I guess, I but, guess it's, you know, going into mania before we get, you know, jumping the gun a little. Yeah. Stephanie sorry. Would sorry. Eventually just uh, uh, align herself with Jericho anyway. So instead of making it an unnecessary affair, Stephanie would just end up being Jericho's manager for a month. Whereas the main event of WrestleMania is pretty much Triple H versus Stephanie with Jericho, the undisputed champion, as a surrogate. Oh, yeah. Jericho, to this day, complains about how he was the undisputed champion. And in the match promo card, Jericho is in the background. He is the world champion, and he is in the background while Stephanie is in the foreground. I feel like Jericho's character would have benefited so much more if he was just, like, the rebellious tweener, I guess, kind of like a CM Punk in some regards. Like... He would just be looking at this like, I don't care about this stupid Helmsley family drama. I'm the goddamn WWE champion, and you can't take that away from me. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Like, Unfortunately, Jericho is definitely death fodder going into WrestleMania. Uh, but before we get to WrestleMania, uh, we have a very, very entertaining segment in the bag. And you're going to have to help me out with this when I get to this point. But um, Rock is, you know, recovering from his match with Undertaker, and NWO appears. And yep. Hulk Hogan wants a photo of Hogan and Rock for his son, which we know is Nick. Uh, Rock and Hogan take a photo together, but here's the thing. Hogan says something under his breath, and to this day, I do not know what Hogan said. Do you know what Hogan said? I think he said some a little something for the people's taste, brother. <laughs> like, And how like is that, that an insult? I don't know. I don't know. Like, I feel like what happened is, like, they were – like, they filmed a segment with Austin earlier, right? I feel like one of the original ideas going in was to do Hogan versus Austin at WrestleMania uh-huh. just because they were the two biggest stars, like, of the Monday Night Wars for both companies. Uh-huh. You know, no disrespect to The Rock, of course, but, like, Austin was everybody's favorite. Everybody bought these shirts like hotcakes, and it was, you know, Austin was the shit back then. And Hogan was kind of the, you know, he was kind of one of the guys that was driving WCW into the ground, always thinking for himself, the creative control brother. You know, like, not investing in the company's future. That's why guys like Chris Jericho left. But, like, Hogan versus Austin would have been an interesting match. And a lot of people say that that's the match they should have done. 
But I feel like they filmed this segment with The Rock just in case. Like, they had, yeah. like, a backup yeah. plan. And I think they were still deciding on what match they wanted to do. I don't, yeah. think they, I don't think they decided on Hogan versus Rock until the next night on Raw with that yeah. whole – Yeah, And I'm but, getting ahead of myself. Yeah, but. after Hogan makes that offhanded comment, which somehow offends The Rock, The Rock goes into one of his classic blunders. I love this segment so much because it definitely takes the edge off of the NWO – because if NWO is here, they think they're these big badasses. But Rock has to remind everyone that, you know, Scott Hall was Chico, Razor Ramon. Got to make fun of him for that. And, you know, Kevin Nash over here is Big Daddy Cool Diesel. <laughs> definitely telling them, insulting them, telling them to pass the camera down the line. Give it to Hogan. He's going to turn that son bit sideways and shove it up all their candy asses. That is one of my favorite Rock lines in my life is that promo right there. And yeah. it never... Yeah. It never fails to get a laugh out of me because it is just so good. The Rock is just so good. He made the NWO look like chumps. He definitely How to destroy like... someone's career in one promo starring The Rock. <laughs> I don't know I mean, if he necessarily destroyed their careers at that moment, but it was, it was definitely fun. The only disappointment was that he had no clever joke for Hogan. He just said, give it to Hogan. I'm just like, you couldn't really, Hogan is just, He's so easy. He's an easy target, and you got nothing for him. But anywho, that is one of my favorite, one yeah. of my favorite rock promos of my life. He could have just done the the line he did about Hogan like a year earlier, like "What you gonna do when the fight?" Oh, don't, 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 get, don't get me started on that. Don't, don't. A year later, when he faces Hogan at No Way Out, <laughs> that cracks me up because when The Rock was turning heel, loved his stuff. Again, me I'm, too. Definitely, um, when we get to that, we'll, we we will get to that when we get to that, and I will talk about how much I loved Hollywood Rock. But, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, anyway, promo. what is our main event, Tomas? <laughs> our main event is Stone Cold Steve Austin challenging Chris Jericho for the World Wrestling Federation title. The Basically, the backstory to this match is that Jericho is calling Austin a junkie, a drug addict, and Austin says his drug is being the WWF champion. Basically, how I look at this feud is, Austin knows his time is starting to wind down here in the WWF. So he feels like he needs to win the world championship to basically remain relevant. Yeah. And you know what? I'm just thinking about this. Like this sounds very eerily similar to the amazing few that CM Punk had with Jeff Hardy in 2009. Um, and even more so with uh, Brock Lesnar versus Eddie Guerrero for a couple of years, like a couple of years after this. But um, I mean, like how the challenger is saying they're addicted to the world title you know they need that but um stone cold steve austin is going for his seventh world title at this pay-per-view he won uh this title shot by pinning kurt angle on raw in one of the best matches you'll actually see on raw the entire year i thought his match with angle to get this title shot was incredible if you haven't seen that whenever, match yeah whenever austin and angle you know some good parts of 2001 was uh austin and angle's feud uh, back when Austin was a heel and Angle was a babyface, they definitely had some good matches there. Austin and Angle, that's one of those uh, hidden gem feuds that I think about when I think about Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately yeah. for this match, definitely not a, a strong match. Uh, yeah. I really can't remember much from it, to be perfectly honest. It was your standard wrestling match. Uh, if you want to take the reins for this one, go right ahead. Yeah, oh, gladly. So um, they give each other the bird to start off. Um, good trash talk between the two. They kind of lock up twice at the beginning, which is kind of unnecessary, if I say so myself, to lock up twice. Um, Austin with very stiff shots and chops in this match. Um, loud what chants from the audience every single time he bashes Jericho's head into the buckle. Because you remember, the what gimmick was over at this point. Um, and not whether just that was annoying. a good thing or not. That's honestly, yeah. That it, every single wrestling fan is going to have a different opinion on that. Yeah, Austin is bitch slapping Y two J all over ringside, and he doesn't like exactly take them into the crowd like the Rock and Undertaker match did. But referee Earl Hebner once again being very lenient with all this stuff. I I remember they go over towards the entrance way, which I didn't even mention. This entrance way I thought was really cool. You have like three production trucks, like kind of converged in like an iron circle i thought it was a really cool look and jericho I still think that they did a better job with this though because not only did they not go as far again it's a world title match you can get away with the oh referee earl hebner is um giving a lot of leeway to these guys because it's a world title match and you don't want the world title match to end on a count out so yeah and you know they still executed it better here 
because they weren't going all the way to the concourses. They weren't going all the way up in the audience. They were just going, you know, you can make a 10 count if you go up from ringside to the, to the entrance way and back. Totally. Yeah, I agree. It's um, Austin hits a beautiful superplex um, from three out of the four corners that I thought was a really cool sequence. I thought the sequence would have been a lot better if he just did a superplex from all four corners on Jericho, but you know, that's just a little nitpick. Um, yeah, very stiff work. Um, Jericho with a very creative ref grab, so he doesn't see him hit a low blow on Austin. Um, I'm all for, like, being creative with the ref spots so that they don't see the... Yeah, I always thought Jericho did that well, and I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, trying to remember what you're oh, thinking about. Oh, he still about. does. Yeah, Austin probably had him from behind. Uh, Jericho was grabbing the ref, and while he had it there, he just, like, you know, kicked him, kicked him from behind. Yeah, but I only, I actually thought there was a lot of really nice counter wrestling in this match. Just nothing overly spectacular about it. Um, Jericho hits two straight lion salts. Um, there was a really nice um, counter of Austin's Luthez press right into the walls of Jericho. Um, oh yeah, some really nice counter wrestling. Um, Y2J grabs the title belt, and we get yet another ref bump at this point. <laughs> Um, can, can he, can he sense that there's like a theme with this show and the refs and, and have you noticed this was the only match, believe it or not, out of all the matches that did not start with the brawl. Yep. <laughs> Between tag team turmoil and the main event were the only matches of the night that did not start with the brawl. And this match had Austin in it. Not only oh. did Austin not take the match all over the arena, he did not start it with the brawl. Well, he did to an extent, but he didn't do it as much as Rock and Taker did. But uh, no, no. Jericho hits a spine buster on the belt, and then Jericho hits a mic check on the belt. Um, both get near falls. And then Jericho accidentally knocks out the ref again. And then Austin puts the walls of Jericho on Jericho. <laughs> and Jericho is tapping out to his own move, but there's no referee. I feel like that was a running theme also, and that era – was uh, just hitting your opponent with your finisher. Oh, yeah. yeah. Jericho with the rock bottom, Austin with the rock bottom, Rock with the Stone Cold Stunner. That, that was, was all over the place. There were so many points. Like, you know, oh, man. But anyway, speaking of, Austin hits a stunner, and that's when we get the NWO run in. And that's – this is – this is where we see the NWO we all know and love. The Invaders coming in to beat the shit out of Stone Cold Steve Austin. NWO shows their true colors, and it only took them three hours. Wow, that was fast. Yep, Scott Hall hits a... Uh, Sto Stone Cold, first of all, is starting to beat all of them off, three on one. Um, that came out very wrong. But anyway, uh, NWO gains the upper hand. Uh, Scott Hall hits a Stone Cold Stunner, which will play into something later. Jericho picks up the scraps and gets the three count off of that stunner. Jericho retains the title. I gave this match, oh man, I, I, I'm going to give this match three and a half stars. I don't know about you. I thought this match was really well worked. I thought the psychology was better. It's probably the best like books match of the entire show. I think like the yeah, NWO me, run in made sense. Yeah. Three and a quarter. Um, it's definitely better than rock and taker. Uh, just, I just felt like there was nothing too much this match. I feel like this was just, we needed a main event. We need something Austin to do. And we need to kickstart Austin to do with Scott Hall, of all people. Uh, and this was just when you just, just, again, no way out always. It's just that roadblock between the Rumble and WrestleMania. So they just needed to get this out of the way so they can get on to WrestleMania. But no harm, no foul. Nothing, nothing offensive about this match. No. Uh, Jericho's able to squeak out another win, and Jericho's going into WrestleMania as the world champion. Which is really, really awesome. It puts Jericho over huge. Um, <laughs> I feel like, th for all intents and purposes, I think this match was my match of the night. I thought it was the best worked match, but I think it was very underwhelming. I feel like it could have been a lot better, considering who was involved. Um, the crowd was almost dead silent for this match until the NWO ran in, which certainly did not help matters. And the ending of this match, the aftermath, um, this was the NWO we all knew and we grew up with, you know? Mm -hmm. like, um, Pretty much they have Austin laid out in the middle of the ring. They grab the spray paint from under the ring. Scott Hall brands the NWO letters on Austin's back, and that's how the pay-per-view ends. Yeah, so so much for NWO turning over that new leaf, huh? 
Yeah, so much for that. Like, my big problem with this is, like, why didn't – why wasn't this the only NWO segment on the show? Like, it – It definitely, you know, you could argue that the opening promo when a guy in eyeballs on the television, everyone was like, oh, my God, look, it's the NWO. They're finally here. But at the same time, how much of a pop would it be even more if you weren't expecting the NWO the entire show and then here they come over the barricade to screw Austin – Think about that. In 2002, New World Order screwed Stone Cold Steve Austin out of the WWF Championship. That's something that would be unheard of in 1998. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And you know what? Like, I mentioned this near the beginning of this review. Like, this was almost like a curtain call in reverse. Like, say you go to a Broadway play, right? I'm just going to use this analogy real quick. Say you go to a Broadway play. And you have all the actors come out and you have them take a bow before all the action starts instead of at the end. That's pretty much what it felt like here. You know, Mm -hmm. you have the NWO come out, you give them a promo, you give them a promo to hype up the crowd, you have them, you know, do all the nostalgic stuff. And then you just have them, you know, just be friendly with the people in the back. And then at the end of the show is when you get the real NWO. It's like, that logic just never made sense to me. It was like reverse booking. You know, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, you think about it, like the NWO was offended that Austin didn't take the beer, but they wouldn't get offended by The Rock basically roasting all of their asses. You think the end of the real NWO would have just three on one beat down The Rock after he said that shit. But, you know, as you know, the upcoming weeks on Monday Night Raw, you see the NWO damn near try to murder The Rock. Yeah, yeah. The next night on Raw, that's something we can talk about uh, for the WrestleMania review, which is coming up fairly soon. But overall, No Way Out 2002, I would, I'm not going to go higher than a 6.5 out of 10 for this show. I thought this was fairly uneventful. Yeah, very uneventful, but nothing too offensive on this show. There was nothing god awful on the show. I feel like it was just there and it got, you know, the WrestleMania build out of the way that they were trying to get. I thought this show, yeah, I agree. This was a very inconsequential show, like, back in hindsight, aside from the NWO stuff, which, again, pretty underwhelming in its own right, aside from the final image of them. Um, But I will say, I liked this show better than the horror show. (laughs) Definitely, I mean, this show... It wasn't, like, it's a very inoffensive show. I thought it was a pretty well-booked show throughout. The horror show definitely was not, but uh, anyway. Sorry to go off on a random tangent, but I just feel like I leave it off on this. Did you hear on Monday Night Raw when uh, Drew McIntyre was saying, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pick the stipulation, and Ziggler said, what's the stipulation? And someone in the crowd yelled out, eye for an eye. (laughs) I don't want to see another eye for an eye match. (laughs) I, uh... I cracked up at that. It's because I, did too. I, I cracked up at that because it's like, you know, everyone around the ring, they're, you know, they're wrestlers. They work for WWE right now. But it's just like the fact that someone went out of their way out of their way to yell eye for an eye. That's something you would hear in a regular crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mad props to whoever screamed that out. But uh Boy, yeah. alert, two weeks, Drew McIntyre versus Dolph Ziggler, eye for an eye. You heard it here first. Oh God, man, I hope not. But anyway, yeah. No Way Out 2002, uh, I think that pretty much does it for this review. Um, thank you once again, Tomas, for hopping on the pod. We're going to have him on again for uh, WrestleMania 18, which should be coming up within these next few weeks, I'd want to guess. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're in a pandemic. We got all the time in the world. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, and, we, and at the same time, we don't have all the time in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go, my friend. You know, keep as busy as possible in this time. Oh, yeah. But, uh, Yeah. Bless you all so much. Uh, Thank you all so much for tuning into this podcast as always. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up on the video if you liked it. If you're new here, please feel free to hit that subscribe button as hard as you possibly can. You guys are all the best. Thank you all so much. With all that being said, look forward to more reviews very soon. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'd actually know what your guys' thoughts on this pay-per-view are down in the comments also. So feel free. Um, With all that being said, back talk, commence.